Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes and today we're going to expand on um, a previous episode on pushing and pulling film. Uh, and I'm not gonna repeat a whole lot of information. I'll put a link in the show notes if you haven't seen the episode. Um, but I wanted to run an experiment this week to see just how far I could really push the limits of pushing film in this particular case. Um, and so really what you gotta remember, it's really easy. I shot 35 millimeter on this. I used my Nikon F3, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute because there's some inconsistencies in the results and uh, we'll talk about maybe what some of the reasons for that are. Um, but essentially what I did is I used Tri-X, which is Kodak's probably most popular film of all time. It's still very much available. You can get Tri-X uh, in any format. Um, it's a good film. It's a very versatile film. There's a lot of different looks you can get out of this film. Um, and it's one that I like. Um, it's one of my favorites. And so just as a test, um, I talked a little bit about stand development and I'm going to talk about my process in a second. But what I did was I wanted to push the limits of what I could do with Tri-X 400. Uh, sometimes in, in this case, um, you know, you're in very low light and your ISO is just not fast enough. You've, you've opened the aperture as wide as it'll go. You've got your shutter speeds as low as you can go without shaking them and it's still not enough. And so that's, you know, an obvious instance where you would want to be able to take the film that you've got and push it. Um, I've had some questions around this and I, I think the safest thing to say, I know there's there's ways you can deal with everything, but really for me, what I, I like to remember is the general rule is that you're gonna need to commit to the entire roll of film. And so if you're gonna put 400 in here and push it, you're gonna push the entire roll. So you can't like set it for different, um, different frames like you can with digital. Um, it's just not, um, uh, is versatile in that sense. However, um, I shot a roll that was only 24 frames. Um, I just took some pictures around the house. So these are not great shots that we're gonna look at, but I want you to see what the film does. Um, essentially, um, I, I went ahead and I just set the meter all the way up at 6400. The F3 will go all the way up to 64. So this is a four stop push. And this is really testing the limits of what Tri-X would do. And it, I'm actually pretty impressed, um, to be honest with you. Uh, four stops is, uh, that's a lot. Um, I haven't tried beyond that, uh, but you know, your, your mileage may vary and you're welcome to experiment. And I'm going to show you how I did this. Um, if you're wondering how I got four stops out of 400 to 6400, remember light is measured in stops. And if you want to increase the light sensitivity, one stop in ISO, you're going to double it. <clears throat> so for instance, we're starting with 400. One stop push would be 800. That gives you a stop a light more. Uh, two stops push would be 1600. I'm doubling it. Another stop beyond that, three stops would be 3,200, and four stops is 6,400. Um, you're able to shoot in pretty low light at 6,400. It's really, uh, it's pretty, pretty convenient. And I remember, like, you know, the whole roll kind of wondering, boy, I wonder if this is even going to work. Um, in the past, I've done my pushing generally uh, with, you know, Kodak makes a T Max 3,200 rating, um, Il Ilford, and Ilford makes one as well. Um, and I've done those, they end up being pretty grainy. And I'll be honest, when we look at the photos here, you'll see what I'm talking about. I kind of like the results of Tri-X more. Um, the way I did this, aside from how I set the camera up, is I did what's called a stand development. And I've talked about that a little bit before. And it's really easy, and I forgot to bring the tank out here so I could show you. Um, but let's say, for our purposes here, um, you go ahead, I use Rodinol. Rodinol is excellent for a stand development. Um, Ag for Rodinol is not available anymore, but if you go to any photo supply, you look at eBay, something like that, you could probably either find Rodinol used, uh, maybe an unopened bottle, um, or you can find the formula is opened up, and there are several other companies that are, that are making um, Rodinol formula, which is the same thing, and so it all works. Um, I know Photographer's Formulary makes one. I believe it. I think Adox makes one. I'll have to double check that. Uh, but anyway, you can get it still. I have some old ag for Rodinol, but it's the same recipe. And I've used the photographer's formula Rodinol. It's, it's just as good. Uh, Rodinol, as I've said before, is a high accutance developer. If you looked at the minimalist darkroom episode that we did, I talked about that. And high accutance <clears throat> basically means it's going to... Oh, in old school film terms uh, from the 50s and maybe the 60s, what that means is it's going to take the film, and, and it's obviously relevant today because I'm using, that's how old the technology is, it's going to give you a, a real sharp image, um, the accutance, the, the contrast on edges, so it gives you the sharpness. Um, the side effect, and also gives you the film speed, uh, but the side effect is that you do increase grain and contrast when you're pushing specifically. So I used Rodinol, but I decided not to develop normally. I decided to do a stand development. And stand gets, it's really easy, uh, but it does seem a little, well, it gets a little tricky when you're trying to figure out what the time should be. 
And I explained stand a little bit before, but basically all we're gonna do is pour the developer in the tank and we're going to develop for the first minute is all I did on this. Um, agitation, when you're moving the film, you have to do it to replenish the, the chemical that's laying up on the film. The more you agitate, the grainier the film can get. So even when I'm developing normally, I try to use a very slow agitation just simply to move the chemical. That's all I'm doing and to get fresh developer up against the film. Uh, you don't want to do this too hard. Uh, it's not cocktail shaker style by any stretch of the imagination. Do not do that um, unless you really want that for effect. Um, super grain and messy film. Um, anyway, stand development. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to develop for the first minute. I'm just going to agitate very slowly for the first minute. After that, we're going to let it sit for two hours is what I determined on this and this was a technique and I would love to give them credit and I, I forgot their name already I need to look it up and give you that but anyway um, but uh, it's a technique I, I got off the web when I searched it and basically what you're gonna do is let this stand for two hours every 30 minutes just for 15 seconds and what I did is I swirled it like a glass of wine just really slowly I didn't even really agitate I just kind of swirled the the container and that's all for 15 seconds I did that every 30 minutes so it was three times during the two hours um, so two hours is a long time you got to remember to pay attention and not forget that it's needing to be agitated um, but I'm pretty proud of the results they, they came out pretty good and I'm pretty impressed with what Tri-X will do um, so what we'll do is let's go ahead and look at some images I'm going to talk about some issues that a few of them have and I have some theories for explanation of why they may have turned out that way because they're not really consistent. The first thing you got to remember is you're shooting uh, generally when you're shooting in very low light it can be very high contrast anyway and remember when you push film you're gonna get a higher contrast as well so a lot of the images are high contrast and it becomes I think increasingly difficult to consistently meter uh, particularly with your camera so I think it's a good idea um, generally when you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing off the cuff kind of improvisational stuff. So you're going to be reliant on the meter. You don't have time to sit there and measure each scene. Um, but learning how to be a little bit more acute with that and a little bit more attentive to, to that situation I think is important. Also bracketing your exposures is really hard. And the last thing I want to say is I'm pushing the F3. It maxes out at 64. And so it could be that some of the images that came out a little bit underexposed, it simply it had a hard time metering because I'm pushed all the way to the end uh, as far as what the camera will do. So. Anyway, let's take a look at a couple images and I'll just pull these up. Um, I, I will say too, as you can see from this first image here, this was uh, emotionally not an easy role of film to develop. Um, this is my cat family and if you follow the vlog you know that uh, he unfortunately passed away and these shots were taken the day before we started having trouble. And uh, this was kind of his final peaceful nap. And so in a way they kind of mean something to me. They're not great shots, uh, you know, these are but they mean something special to me. Um, it's also interesting how old he looks in these and I, I don't think he really looked that way in general. But anyway, as you can see, we do have some grain, but in general, the light wasn't too bad. Um, I'm pretty sure that I stopped this down to F4 and the speed was probably, uh, I think I did this when the sun was still up, so it was probably pretty high. Um, speed was probably a 250th of a second. Uh, but it came out pretty good. This is good light balance. The grain is much smoother. It's a little, a little rough. You can tell I pushed the film and the contrast is a little high, but it's not, it, the results that I've gotten with something like, um, you know, uh, the T-Max 3200 or even the Ilford uh, 3200, um, they're much grainier, honestly. And I think I would prefer Tri-X over either one of those, to be honest, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, these are all going to be images of cats um, because that's what I have around. And I shot this film for the podcast. Okay, now this, this is an image. This is little Judy, um, who's our white cat. And Judy is uh, probably a little bit underexposed, which is why you see a lot of thick grain. Now, um, a couple reasons why I think my F3 is getting a little old, my Nikon, and it probably needs some tender loving care and a little bit of a CLA, um, a little bit of adjustment, make sure the meter's working right, and I probably even could change the battery. So I had some shots that came out a little underexposed on the roll. It could also be because she is a white cat. You can see that we're clearly getting white um, under her chin there. Um, and so maybe that was messing the meter up a little bit. Again, if you can bracket your exposures and, and have two more on there, that's a really good thing to do. So uh, something to consider. And the F3 actually will meter. You can force it to measure up from 64 because you can bracket. Um, it's just tedious to do on that camera. Uh, but as you can see, there's much more contrast and uh, sh her face isn't quite that dark in real life. And there's a lot of grain. Now, this is grainy. 
but I kind of like this look. Um, like I said, your mileage may vary, this is subjective, but I, I like the way this looks. Um, I would use this for a print. Um, I'm interested to see, now another disclaimer is all the negatives, what I did was I developed them, rinsed them, dried them, and scanned them. So what you're seeing here may be different than what you would get on in larger, and I will do that test later where we try to print one of these images and see how it comes out. But for our purposes here, the scanner is pretty forgiving and uh, was able to bump the contrast up. But I don't mind the grain. I think it's, um, it's pleasing. It's nice. Also, another thing I should tell you guys is I, I, I turn all the sharpening off when I scan. I'd rather do that in Photoshop if I have to. Um, and there isn't any sharpening on this image, so just so you'll know. Uh, but it is that grainy. Uh, moving along, another another shot of the, this is Zeter and Judy sharing a moment here, sniffing one another. Um, but anyway, uh, it came out pretty good. The exposure's not too bad. I had to lift this a little bit with the curves adjustment, and there are ways to compensate that if you're trying to make a print as well, but uh, will work. The grain's not as bad. This exposure was a little more, quote unquote, on. But the dark areas, if you need to bring them up, the, the darker areas on the negative will start to pronounce grain if you have to, to lighten them. Uh, this one, I intended to shoot this way, and I thought it was kind of cool. We had a rainstorm blowing in. <coughs> this was uh, a little bit later. This was last Sunday. And uh, Zeter was up in the windowsill, and I knew he, Zeter's hard to shoot because he's kind of a dark gray, and so he comes out just black sometimes because the meter doesn't know what to do with him. Uh, poor guy. But uh, I thought, well, let's play to that, and let's just get kind of a silhouette. And uh, it's, it's an interesting shot. Uh, maybe not the greatest in the world, but, uh, but again, you see the grain is pleasing. It's not disgusting. It's not too gloppy. Um, and, and, you know, you see it in the gradation there in the window, but, um, but it came out pretty good. Uh, moving along, this is another one where you can see high contrast. We've got a concrete floor in here, and this is Judy against the concrete floor. And, and uh, in very low light, I believe this was just a couple lamps in the living room that were all that were lighting it at this point, and it's very high contrast. I did miss the focus on this. This is not part of the development at all. It's just, um, you know, uh, my eyes and manual focusing. And when you're in a hurry, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, and then the final shot here, and this one, the exposure got kind of mixed up. Um, really low contrast we're in the kitchen uh this is finley again this was one of his last dinners and uh, he was looking at me wanting to be fed and i was getting ready to feed him and uh, i actually kind of like the way this came out even though it's a bit of a mess um, there's a little bit of a light flare it looks like coming in i'm not really sure what caused this i think this is a, a, a clearly a case where the meter on the f3 did not meter correctly and i probably had to pull it up from the negative However, I kind of do like the mysterious kind of smoky quality to it where, you know, the details are kind of faded back into the back. Again, look at the grain. It's not too bad. Um, one thing you might want to do is if you're on YouTube, flip on the HD settings so you can really see the grain in these images. Um, but my whole point here is that, that this is pretty good looking film for something that I pushed four stops higher than it should have gone. A couple things I could try. One is, uh, you know, obviously the adjustment of the camera, making sure the meter is correct, and I could probably balance that. Um, generally with darkroom stuff like this, whether it's film or whether it's printing, um, if there are issues like I'm having here where, where some of these images are a little bit underexposed, what I like to do is don't try to solve any more than one thing at a time. Um, it gets too confusing and you can fix the problem and create another one and not realize that's what happened. So I think it's really important when you're trying to fix something is make one adjustment at a time. So the first thing I would do is probably try an, a different camera that I trust a little more with the meter. Um, this F3 is starting to get a little old. I haven't had it serviced in a long time. I have an F4 that I, that I would trust a little better, even though I do not like the form factor as much. I really like this camera. Um, so maybe I would switch that out first, or I would go ahead and get the F3 um, to a repair shop and see if I could do something with that. Um, if that didn't work, the other thing is it could possibly be that two hours is not enough time or that I can't push it any further. And that's what I would experiment with. It's actually pushing my development time just a little bit longer. Um, generally with development time, and I'm not real sure how it works with a stand development, but with normal development, you want to add 30% of time, 33% time onto your development roughly for each stop. So you need to do a little math there and figure out, you know, okay, if this is my development time, I need to add 33% on that to get a stop higher. So it's one thing you can think about. Um, so anyway, I would, I would take this one at a time. These results are pretty close. Um, I will probably experiment some more. I don't know if I'll cover it here or not, but it, it is interesting to me um, that 
Tri-X performs so well. I, I, a friend of mine and I usually joke that Tri-X is kind of the Charlie Brown of films because it just, um, it, it tends to be always consistent, sometimes entertaining, and, and you know, it's reliable. It's good old Charlie Brown. But uh, anyway, but that's good old Tri-X. Um, so anyway, um, try stand development, see what you think. Um, try pushing to extremes. I've seen other people do it. Um, when I started out doing stand development, this was uh, more than a few years ago, and a lot of the, the sources would say, oh, well, it only works with slow speed films. Well, 400 speed is a medium to high speed film, depending on what area you're looking at. Uh, when Trax came out, it was a very high speed film. But anyway, and it worked just fine. You're gonna get grain, that's okay. Uh, if you don't want grain, that's the trade-off. It's like everything in photography comes with a trade-off. If you want more, speed you're going to have to deal with more grain um, or you're going to have to give up the speed to deal with less grain so there's everything's a trade-off no matter what you do even exposure is a trade-off uh, if you're going to open up the uh, the shutter speed you've got to shut down the aperture or if you need to open up the aperture aperture you're going to have to lengthen the shutter speed so anyway you guys know all that but um, anyway i hope you got something out of this um, down the road i will try and print a couple of these images and see what comes up uh, before I do that, I want to talk about the Minimalist Darkroom Setup Part 2. I've got some chemicals on order. Um, I showed you the Minimalist Setup um, recently and how we're going to work with that to develop the film. And I want something equally kind of minimalist uh, to deal with printing uh, because this has all got to fit in a very confined space and uh, I just want it to be that way. So, and I want to show you guys how little it takes to actually do some cool work. So anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Um, I think also it would be interesting to talk about digital photography and high SOs too, uh, because it has a very different problem. You don't have grain, but you have digital noise um, in the image. And there's some ways around that and some things, especially when you're converting to black and white that I want to share with you guys, but we will save that for another episode. Anyway, once again, guys, thank you so much for watching. This has been The Art of Photography. I'll see you next time.